where you want. Thank you all for coming. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Max Levine. I'm a second year MBA uh, Wharton student. And I am honored today to have the opportunity to introduce today's guest lecturer, Mr. James Jim Murin, Chairman and CEO of MGM Resorts International. Before I go into Mr. Murin's uh, incredibly long list of accomplishments, I thought I would provide some context behind today's events. Last year, I attended the Travel and Hospitality Club's annual Las Vegas trek. And I reached out to Mr. Murin, whom I had met a few years earlier, to see if he'd be willing to speak with us. Not only did he agree, but he gave us a a speech that blew us away. And it was easily one of the best and most inspiring I've heard during my time at Wharton. As a member of our leadership lecture committee this year, I reached back out to Mr. Murin to see if he'd be willing to speak to the broader Wharton community. Now that you have the backstory, here's a, here's a real intro. Mr. Murin spent 14 years on Wall Street, most notably as a leading equity research analyst at Deutsche Bank before being asked to join MGM in 1998 as CFO. In 2007, Jim became president of MGM, and in 2008, he became chairman and CEO. During his tenure at MGM, Mr. Murin is credited as the architect of MGM's tremendous strategic growth. Here's a quick sample of some of the initiatives Mr. Murin has led. The $6.4 billion merger with Mirage Resorts in 2000, MGM's acquisition of Mandalay Bay Resort Group in 2005, and he was the visionary of City Center, which has revolutionized the Las Vegas experience. Today, we have a speaker with a unique perspective of entertainment and hospitality, leadership of a rapidly expanding enterprise, and vision to grow global, a global brand across multiple decades. With that in mind, we think this video serves as a fitting introduction.
What do you guys think? Is that all right? Uh, anyone want to work for MGM now? Is that uh, interesting? Um, Max, it's good to see you again. Uh, Max went to Johns Hopkins University, very fine school. I've known him since he was an undergrad, and uh, I'm a fan of JHU, and I'm a fan of Max, so uh, I do what Max tells me to, and that, that brings me here. I also do what my wife tells me to, which is in the front row here. Uh, Johnny, how am I doing so far? All right. So uh, I'm going to spend about 20, 25 minutes chatting with you today and, and hopefully give you a bunch of time for questions. There are a bunch of folks here I know in the other room. I hope you have some, and uh, I'm excited to be here, so let's, uh, let's have some fun together. I think you can try to grasp the idea that we do believe at MGM that entertainment is, in fact, a fundamental human need. Um, it's not a nice to have, it's something that's core uh, to the human experience. It energizes us, it creates uh, imaginatory experiences, it connects people together. Um, and of course, like we said in the video, uh, mankind was not born uh, to be bored. Uh, and to prove that, I'm going to be brief. Uh, and it opened up to Q&A. <clears throat> but I want to do this because this is actually the first time I've ever told uh, the MGM story the way I see it. And I thought it was quite appropriate that I would be able to do so here at Wharton, one of the greatest business schools uh, in the world. Um, I thought uh, you might find it interesting, and plus you're a captive audience and so I figured uh, I got you for a while, um, so let me know uh, what you think about it. As you probably know, <clears throat> by the video at least, MGM Resorts itself uh, is not necessarily a household name to a lot of folks, but obviously our brands are, whether it's in Las Vegas, the Bellagio and MGM, Mirage, more recently in the D.C. area, National Harbor, uh, we own Borgata in Atlantic City, Borvage on the Gulf Coast, uh, and of course, far away, in a far place called Macau, uh, we own a very profitable resort there and opening another one in a couple months. The origins of our company date way back into the 70s, but um, I really would start by saying that it's been the last 10 years that has really defined our company. So we're a relatively new company with uh, historical roots, um, built entirely on new strategies and uh, fortunately for us, on an entirely new trajectory. But this was not <clears throat> inevitable. We had no model at MGM to follow, nor the company in my industry has ever embarked upon the path that I'll chat about today. And I got to tell you, it didn't happen by accident. This was the result of a series of very deliberate actions that we've taken over the last uh, decade. And looking back, as I was preparing for this, I can put them into five areas, five strategic uh, initiatives that, since I became the CEO about a decade ago, uh, I've focused on. And I think it's working. Number one, really had to forge a unified company. For those of you who may know my industry, it really was not a cohesive, uh, highly tuned, professionally run organization. A bunch of disparate properties, great creative minds, but uh, certainly not one where you would say, um, there was a unified vision, particularly in our case, because uh, we were born initially out of two companies. When I was a CFO of MGM Grand, I acquired Mirage Resorts. Um, that created two different companies. And in fact, just to make it all the more preposterous, we called ourselves MGM Mirage at the time, as if to advertise to the world, we're not one company, uh, but actually two. It was impossible to reach consensus on important internal items. The properties competed against one another. My predecessor called it uh, constructive conflict. I call it destructive conflict. 
And uh, we inherited uh, a lot of the shortcomings of the entire industry, if we could be candid, and that industry thinking. You see, the, the industry, from a business school perspective, you'd look at us and say, historically, we weren't really a very sophisticated industry. Certainly, as it came to technology and innovation, most of the companies don't have big strategic plans. They certainly don't promote the values that I care about, um, like diversity and inclusion, sustainability. And in fact, historically, the industry struggled to really look past the next project or the next year. And that's been the way it's always been since the dawn of time. The dawn of time was February of 1984 when I became an analyst covering this industry. That's the dawn of time. And so I know this industry uh, inside and out uh, for the better part of 30 odd years. And that's the situation I inherited when I became the president, moving up from the CFO, which was really a capital markets job, into the president and COO, totally different position, an operating job. I really felt when I got into that role, we had to create one vision for the company and then hone it and reinforce it um, so that all of our decisions and really all the actions of all my employees really were aligned on a vision. And we had to look at that vision in terms of how MGM should play a role. And I'm, you're going to learn a little bit in this, kind of a bleeding heart in some of these areas, particularly as it relates to sustainability and diversity and inclusion. And so I felt that in the good old boy industry that I was in, that I needed to make a lot of demonstrable changes, and we certainly have. And that started in 07. Fast forward an entire year to 08, I became the chairman and CEO in kind of a battlefield promotion, right when the financial crisis was at its peak. And I remember that time, that, um, that really brutal time. Very happy with the fact that uh, I had a great team around me and that we had seen at least some of the warning signs. Some of you, my mid-market properties were starting to struggle way back in 06 and 07. And so we embarked on a project we called Evolve. And it was painful, but we cut costs dramatically in 07, 08. So by the time we got into the end of 08, um, at least we had a chance. But we had a belief then that if we don't change, materially change the way we do business, we're going to fail. And I'd be not far from here in Delaware, kind of sorting out uh, what's, who's going to get what uh, in bankruptcy court. So the Evolve Project, I remember it. It was painful. It was tough but at least it bide us some time. And then we made a lot of really big changes when I became the CEO. Now, CEOs do that, uh, typically. I'll tell you why I did what I did and some of the changes I made. Number one, I didn't like the people I had around me, not all of them. So I got rid of them. Companies don't do that. They really don't. Sometimes you keep people too long. You can have great, great executives. You can have great professionals. But if they don't share your core values, they don't share your belief system, if they're not mission driven, they shouldn't be with your company. And I've seen a lot of companies when I was uh, on Wall Street not make these decisions to their long-term detriment. I thought it was critical to do it. We did it. Building a core team, that gave us a chance to actually build a very strong strategic map. And again, I'm telling you, you might not believe this, um, but companies didn't have strategic plans in my industry back in 06 and 07, 08. And why should we? We were making so much money. Las Vegas was doing so well. The company that I joined at $15 a share went to 100. Uh, there wasn't a desire 
or even an understanding of what we should do to build a framework to run a company on a professional trajectory. Um, I started doing that when I became the CEO. Centralizing these areas, changing the name of the company, creating a set of core values, a belief system, making sure that we all are on the same page in terms of how we're going to promote our properties. What is the company culture going to be? How are we going to treat our employees? How do we work in communities? What are our technology systems going to be? Are we going to market our properties as a cohesive enterprise or go back to those bad old days of destructive conflict? Can we centralize, improve efficiencies, and also drive revenue? And can we start bringing some professional analytics uh, to bear? And we did that. More importantly, uh, I'm going to spend time on this. I felt strongly about changing the company culture. You see, I was on Wall Street for a long time, where I met my smoking hot wife uh, in 1988 in a bar. Uh, can we say it now? It's been 28 years, for God's sake. So. My line was a typical one. I'm going to try to find your job. I'm, see, I'm five years older than Heather. Uh, and uh, that's even more information than you want me to share. But you see, I saw Wall Street right then, in the 80s and 90s. And I also saw my wife, who also became an II number one analyst in consumer products, one of the top females in all of Merrill Lynch, ran global consumer products. Uh, for Merrill Lynch, I saw what she had to do relative to me. Why? Because she's an attractive woman, that's why. She had to work harder. It was tougher. Uh, and uh, I didn't like it. So we moved to Las Vegas, and I said, honey, you know, we're moving to Las Vegas. We're getting out of that good old boy network, and we're going to go to Las Vegas. And what did we find? A bigger good old boy network. And so uh, I really feel strongly about this subject about culture, about changing from within how we interact with one another, the sense of inclusion and diversity and dignity. And I disrupted that good old boys network in Las Vegas, and I'm proud to say that that does not exist at our company. And frankly, uh, we're leading by example. It exists less than it did, though more than it should. I also realized that Part of the problem was we were listening to ourselves. We weren't recruiting broadly. We weren't getting a diverse pool of talent. So you get what you get. So we embarked in 08 and 09 in a more robust recruiting strategy, finding new ideas all around the world. It's working. You look at our company today, it is the most diverse, um, certainly in our industry but one of the most in the United States, from my board to my C-suite to my property management in finance, legal, accounting, marketing, really across uh, the portfolio of my company. Uh, and I'm proud of it. And we're a better company for it. The second strategic initiative was we have to really embed into our company a sense of continuous improvement. The idea that you have to break up the status quo, you have to challenge the way you do things. And you see, um, that was hard to do because this industry was so financially successful from the outside. So we had to put an architecture in place to do that. Um, and though we were doing well coming out of the recession, better than our peers, I wasn't happy with the trajectory of my revenue and profit growth. And so um, we set about to change that. We pivoted away from simply cutting costs and trying to drive revenue uh, to really challenging everything that we did and how we did it. So we took a look at our P&L. And I got $4 billion of annual expenses, $4 billion. And we looked at every single line item, every single thing that we do, 
how we're staffed, what technology we use, what are our vendor relationships like. We looked at our business from a revenue and an expense perspective and throughout the portfolio. We also looked outside the company for ideas. I talked to a lot of my friends that run Fortune 100 companies that have been through this before. And they shared some great knowledge with us. Even hired consultants, which I viscerally can't stand. Um, many of you which will be going there, I'm sure, overcharging me for ideas that I can come up with myself. Um, but in this case, uh, they were helpful. This is the only time I can think of that they were, but they were very helpful. And uh, we pulled out $400 million of annual expenses. I, I put dropped $400 million of cash flow annually to our bottom line just in the last year and a half. and took our margins from 24% to 30% in the span of three years. We have the highest margins now in our industry. Making the company sustainable, stronger, more rigorous, more disciplined has so many other benefits, not only more, being more profitable, but it really changes the way we wake up in the morning and think about how to do our business and recruiting talent, finding the brightest minds. Again, looking for diversity of ideas and people, not just um, looking at the same old places. And I started hiring from all around the country. You'd be surprised at our, our roster of folks from Google and Facebook and, and Uber and all the banks and, yeah, the consultants. Uh, we've got a bunch of them. Um, and I've found that it's really becoming quite um, attractive particularly for your generation. Because you see, I talk shamelessly about our CSR efforts. And I know that people coming into the workforce today care deeply about uh, finding companies that share their sense of core values, their sense of right and wrong. And uh, I win most of those conversations once people get into you know, how we run a company, not just what we do. We also created a project management office. Consider it like our, our Skunk Works operation. We have about 30, 40 people in there. Um, they're the ones that challenge all these ideas that we have, bring them to the finish line. And then I move them in um, quickly in to really senior positions. So they're already now, this is three years into this, running properties, running departments, running divisions, uh, having senior jobs. And their career trajectory has been um, quite remarkable. I think if you looked at our financial results, maybe this should be a study here, Max. Um, we're outperforming everyone in our industry. Last six quarters, double-digit growth in earnings, margins I mentioned, revenues growing. And our leverage, which was so high during the recession at a point when most people that were counting us out uh, because we're building a big project now stands at 4.4 times, um, half the leverage of uh, uh, Wynn Resorts, as an example, um, and uh, declining, even though we've been investing billions of dollars in growth over the last few years. The third area I'd say was to look at us holistically from an entertainment perspective. Because as you saw, I mean, that's really the way we view our company. Not just a gaming company, uh, but really a holistic entertainment company with those five-star hotels that we own, the great restaurants and the nightclubs and the conference facilities, retail, and live entertainment. Do you know we sold 8 million tickets last year to our uh, live entertainment events? We're the largest entertainment company the most uh, successful arena in the United States, three months in a row, is T-Mobile. I just built it uh, a year ago. Um, and to think that we can bring the world to our properties um, is a remarkable customer acquisition tool. 
because we find that people keep coming back. I tried this back in 04 when I came up with the idea of city center. City center, Max mentioned, mixed use project, seemed like a great idea uh, until the recession hit. Um, and then it became uh, the poster child of the project that would doom Las Vegas. The Wall Street Journal blared headlines that city center was going to go bankrupt uh, and that 10,000 construction workers were going to lose their jobs. Um, now, the headline is, it's one of the most successful projects uh, in Las Vegas, and it is the single largest green project in all of North America. It received uh, six golds from the U.S. Green Building Council, and it defined how we look at architecture and sustainability in the future, which you could see now if you drive, maybe this weekend, over to National Harbor. Anyone been to National Harbor yet uh, on the Potomac? What do you think? Okay, good. <laughs> I was risky. <laughs> um, we opened it up in December, uh, spent a billion five, went out and employed 4,000 people, uh, and already it's the largest and most uh, profitable regional resort, and it sees over 20,000 people a day. So you weren't alone uh, when you were there, particularly on the weekend. And we're doing it again in Macau. We're doing it again in Massachusetts when we open up in Springfield last year, next year. And we're doing it in Dubai, where I was with uh, Sheikh Mohammed three weeks ago. Um, and we're doing a project for the royal family, um, building the largest seaside resort in Dubai um, on Jumeirah Beach. Uh, it'll have an MGM and a Bellagio and obviously no gaming because I'm in the entertainment business and I believe my brands travel uh, and so does Dubai. And in Las Vegas, uh, the billions I've been spending lately have not been in the casino floor um, and yet casino revenues keep rising, um, which tells you that there is a market for gambling. But if you were to look at my non-gaming revenue, uh, it's growing exponentially faster, and that's intentionally so. The fourth area I'd like to focus on for a second is where I started, on social responsibility. This is a strategic pillar of our company. And there are reasons for this um, that are important, business reasons too. First, let's start with my employees. The majority of my employees are minorities. How could I not uh, be a leader in diversity and inclusion and represent my employees the way I believe as a CEO I should? How do we create the kind of environment, very labor intensive environment, where all men and women feel included? Their points of view are going to be heard that their differences will be honored and celebrated. And how, if you create that environment, will that help you? I can prove that it does, because a more engaged workforce creates more revenue, because people do not go to Bellagio just to see the fountains. They go to meet people and be entertained and be served by my men and women there. So it drives revenue. It also reduces expenses because my, my retention rate is better than anyone else in my industry. Fewer people leave MGM than all of my competitors. Why? Because they like working there more. Um, and it's a very transient business. If you can retain your employees, certainly your best and brightest particularly, you reduce your training costs the recruiting costs, and you get a better quality, more experienced employee. We also feel that if we are, in fact, going to live our values, we have to live them in our communities. We have to be good community partners. Because, you see, we believe that you can't be a sustainable company if you don't help the communities in which you operate be sustainable themselves. You, you're, you're inextricably linked, aren't you? 
Um, and so that's been a core value for our company. For those that would remember the horrible hurricane, Katrina, where was uh, the federal government's effort focused on? It was my property at Beau Rivage. Beau Rivage rebuilt itself, uh, kept all the employees working, and became the hub for the relief efforts after Katrina. And then after the BP oil spill, where did the government land? At Beau Rivage, because we left, uh, we lent out our hand, and we helped uh, that environmental recovery effort. Not as far from here, think of Detroit, and think of the Great Depression and recession that hit Detroit. Why did and how did Detroit come out of bankruptcy? It was the casino industry led by MGM. Um, that revenue was the reason um, in studies you'll see that Detroit was able to get out of bankruptcy as soon as it did. Um, and we're one of the largest employers in the city even to this day. And of course at home in Las Vegas, I'm the largest employer and the largest taxpayer in the state of Nevada. In fact, that's a little trivia for you. There's no company in the United States that represents a higher percentage of a state budget than MGM. One company, 12% of the entire state budget. So it should not be therefore surprising to you to know that it was MGM that led this really stunning recovery that Las Vegas has had uh, since the recession. Detroit, Springfield, Mass coming up, Prince George's, that's in Maryland, Las Vegas, working with communities, uh, making sure that you do what you can uh, to help those communities survive. And that's what we can prove, that we're not just a one-shot bump when we go in and build a multi-billion dollar project or employ a few people. It's that we're there every year. Our kids are in their schools. Uh, we're involved in the nonprofits. We are literally intertwined in these communities and become the kind of community partners that other communities want to see. That's how I won in Maryland. That's how we won. The people in Maryland said, I'm not so sure I want another casino. Uh, I'm not so sure that we want table games. But they, they found out about MGM and what we do in communities and how we are going to hire and how we're going to hire locally and how we're going to work with minority businesses and disadvantaged-owned businesses, and veteran-owned businesses, and women-owned businesses, and we made a lot of promises. I first made a promise to Heather, she's from Maryland, but then I made a promise to the governor and then to the county, and we kept all those promises. In fact, we exceeded everyone's expectations, which is why we are the preferred developer now in new markets if they open up in the U.S. And I think that is a message that should translate to other companies. You can do good and do well all at the same time, make a bucket full of money, and do the right thing. And if you do the right thing, um, you can actually encourage others or shame them or whatever to also do the right thing. Build more environmentally responsibly than developers typically do. Hire uh, more locally. Get involved in the food chain more robustly. Help small farms, small businesses. You can do all this if you have the mission and the passion and the determination to do it and still make a bunch of money. Um, and we're proof of that. The final one, and I think it validates um, the first four, is uh, it's all about results, right? So. We're a Fortune 300 company. We've outperformed our peers in the last year, last three years, last five years. Um, we have um, exceeded most of the uh, analyst expectations. Most of them have buys on us. Their price targets are too low, but they have buys on us. Um, and you think, well, you know, maybe we should hang out at the beach or something. Um, 
But no, because we're not content. We think we're just scratched the surface. I think there's a lot we can do. And I want to. And I'm just going to give you a few things that I'm working on personally that I think is going to take us to another level. One is our technology. We have, for you data folks here, we have 1.3 petabytes of data. Petabytes? Are you kidding? That's like banks have that kind of data. Um, and so for the last several years, I've been hiring folks because I have no freaking idea what that means. Um, I've been hiring a lot of people um, to help us sort through the data and become more intelligent about how we can use that data uh, to understand our customers better. And I think we do now understand that better than anyone in our industry. So using technology um, without losing the personal touch, which is critical to the hospitality business. On financial deals, um, that's what I've done all my life. The Mandalay Resort deal was a $7.8 billion deal. City Center costs $9 billion. I'm spending $3.5 billion in Macau, $950 million in Springfield, Mass. I've done about $75 billion of transactions just in the last 16 years, $75 billion of debt, of equity transactions. It's so funny when the banks call me and ask me, you know, can they, can I, can they help me? I'm like, sure, you can give me a fairness opinion, but I don't need you for M&A because I do it my own. I have the best corporate finance department, I think, um, that you can have and certainly would rival a lot of the boutiques in the country. So looking at using my financial talent and team uh, to grow, I think there's a lot more there. Using technology um, in terms of virtual reality, esports, bringing more people into our venues, uh, just scratching the surface there. I'm spending about $7 million right now on some seed capital and some um, companies we've incubated. Looking at new markets, um, been in Europe, certainly in the UAE, in Asia, and uh, spent a lot of time in Japan where I believe uh, we, are, we have the pole position there if something happens in that market. And um, our structure itself, um, it might not be readily apparent to you, but I'm the chairman of not one company, but actually three companies. I only get paid for one of them. Because MGM Resorts owns a controlling interest in MGM growth properties. That's a triple net lease REIT company I brought public last April. I chair that. Um, it has only one natural competitor in its space. And in every respect, MGP is vastly superior in terms of balance sheet, asset quality, growth. Um, and it has an open field for acquisitions. So you're going to see MGP uh, likely acquire rapidly over the next five years uh, because it has a unique security uh, and very limited competition. That gives us enormous power. MGP owns the real property of many of the resorts uh, that MGM uh, Resorts runs, and as I say, we, we control it. We own 76% of it. We also control MGM China. That's a Hong Kong listed company that I chair. MGM China is the enterprise that owns our Macau operations. That's literally doubling its cash flow this year when we open in a few months our second property there. And at MGM Resorts, that balance sheet that continues to get stronger has been out investing in new properties uh, like Maryland in Massachusetts um, and building talent, which has been one of our best assets. And that's when um, I decided to come over and talk to Max and talk to you. Because I saw the list of the uh, companies you guys are going to go to or are looking to go to all really great companies, but kind of like, yeah, kind of predictable. Um, so I want MGM uh, to be on that list, uh, maybe even one of the top choices you think about. Um, and this is my pitch. We are 
innovative. Um, we are as technology interesting and driven as you can get. Um, we have a very entrepreneurial spirit. We pay well. I'm a Wall Street guy. If you like uh, to be in leading edge companies on marketing, well, we could be your company. If you want to do multi-billion dollar deals, no one's done more than I have uh, in this industry, and we're going to do more. If uh, you're entrepreneurial, you want to create jobs for yourself, I've got dozens of employees that have done that uh, because they saw an opportunity. They saw an unmet need. And when you have 43 million people visiting Las Vegas, uh, then there's a lot of ideas that can be um, tested. If you want to see a company grow to the next level, a company that already has proven itself for the last decade, um, I'm your guy because I just signed a new contract. My kids are in school. My wife likes to travel with me, and I love my company. Um, and I think what I do best is um, give people an opportunity to grow. That's actually the thing I like the most and create careers for people and opportunities and value people that take chances like Heather and I did when we left the safety of Deutsche and Merrill Lynch in New York with a nice place on Central Park and a farm in Connecticut and to move to Las Vegas. Um, that was a risk. And uh, a lot of people have taken that risk and I reward them for doing that. So if that idea appeals to you, um, let me know. I'm in Las Vegas. Um, or if you just need a room like Max, uh, or want to get into a hackathon, or uh, um, I, I just want to leave you with the fact that I'm incredibly proud to be here, a school I probably could never have gotten into, um, to talk to men and women that are the future of, uh, of industry. And to tell you a little bit about how we are a bit different than you might guess. And leave you with the idea that uh, if you have those kind of ideas um, and that kind of ambition, um, Las Vegas is, is a place. Um, and MGM, a global company, is a place where a lot of those ideas become careers. So I think that we have some time, Max, for questions. Is that all right? All right, thank you. All righty. Oh. Honey, did I talk too long? OK, OK. All right, yes, sir. Yeah, so the question is, how do I see online gaming change? Um, the industry is divided on this point. Some of my competitors believe that online gaming should be uh, shut down, should be uh, criminalized, um, and should be avoided at all costs because they're concerned that it will uh, negatively impact the bricks and mortar business. You know, think of booksellers versus Amazon as a you know an example. I disagree totally. Um, I think that is another channel for me to acquire customers, and that. Um, if somebody would rather be home, you know, playing online than going to Bellagio, I'm totally fine with that because there's only one Bellagio. There's only one National Harbor, and we create experiences. We don't create, you know, gambling device mechanisms. So I'm actually a proponent as long as it's um, regulated robustly, which it's not today, um, and it's, it's – um, it's populated by companies like mine that are, are highly, highly scrutinized and that uh, underage people cannot gamble and others that are not allowed to gamble should not be allowed to. Um, this is a debate that's been pushed to the back burner. It's not an agenda item in Congress right now, um, but uh, I think it will percolate over time. But under the right circumstances, I'm a proponent of that. And the American Gaming Association, which I also chair as the lobbying group for this industry, also supports that under those circumstances. 
where I think is more likely to happen is sports betting is more likely to become uh, more pre uh, prevalent. Um, and I think they're going to repeal a law that made it legal only in Nevada. Um, and now New Jersey's uh, questioning that. I think sports betting should be allowed everywhere. Um, and uh, it's a tremendous linkage between you know, our resort industry and the sport industry. And I think that's the first thing we'll see. Yes, sir. So you guys are making uh, a lot of big lump sum capital investments that take a while to actually you know, occur or happen. Um, how do you think about balancing that in such a cyclical industry? That's, it's an excellent question. Is that um, historically, and if you look at the origins of these companies, they were founder driven. You know, the legends of our industry, the, 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 the man that created my company, uh, Kirk Kokorian, only died two years ago. He's 98 years old. American hero. Created the largest hotel in the world like three different times. Uh, it was always what's the next biggest, greatest thing or Bill Bennett at Circus Circus, or Jay Sarno at Caesars, or Steve Wynn with the Mirage, and then Bellagio, or Sheldon Adelson. The, the industry has been traditionally driven by these, these owner developers. And as a result, the capital is very lumpy. Um, and it exposes you to cycles. Uh, and we found out the hard way during the Great Recession, because we were building this big project and uh, the recession hit. Um, so I vowed uh, never to put ourselves in that position again. Um, so that's why you have to have a, a fortress-like balance sheet. You have, and that's why my leverage is 4-4 now, down from 10 times at the, the worst time. And it's going to be 3.5 to 4 times by the end of next year. So having a fortress balance sheet is one way. Secondly, having rigorous ROIC calculations on projects and just agree that you can't do everything that might make sense because you have to balance capital with other ways of returning capital to owners. I just instituted a quarterly dividend, for example, at MGM or share repurchase or further debt reduction or continue to reinvest in the businesses. Um, so the idea will be, I think, that capital spending for us will be far less lumpy going forward because of the size of our company and because um, our CapEx is uh, fairly defined over the near term. And frankly, because if we wanted to build a project, we would do it uh, in other ways. I would use that REIT that we talked about. I would partner with a Japanese consortium of companies if I go to Japan. I wouldn't rely on the MGM Resorts balance sheet solely uh, to build projects. I don't think that's a good uh, long-term idea to do. And so my guess is that our our capital spending will be more clearly defined. And I think that will lead ultimately to valuation uplift in the industry. Because uh, the industry, the gaming industry, since the dawn of time, remember the dawn of time, uh, trades between seven and 10 times cash flow, enterprise value to EBITDA. Um, when every other asset class, hotels and otherwise, obviously trade at a premium, you'd say, well, why is that? It can't be because of the old reasons. The old reasons were that people didn't understand the business, didn't want to invest in the business. Well, now state funds invest in it. There's game, gambling in 40 states. It can't be that reason. The reason is more, uh, I think, uh, more valid, which is that investors are less confident that these kind of companies are going to return capital to shareholders um, and have more predictable earnings growth in the future. And that's why it's a strategic goal of my company and my board to prove that point out. I think I'll be rewarded with a higher valuation than we currently have if we do that. Yes? The entertainment and travel business, could you see yourself become more of a franchisee? Um, of your concepts and of the brands that you have developed uh, the same way that hotel business have done? Or will you be operating and running a lot of the hotels as you currently do? So it, it's market specific. Good question. So in Dubai, um, we're not investing a dollar in Dubai. That's a we, we are the advisor on a development project that will cost over 3 
$1.6 billion. Um, and for those that know Dubai, the Burj Arab, how to Google that guy, right? Look at the beach, look right next to it, and there's 20 hectares of land called Porto Island that was never developed. That's where we're building the Bellagio and uh, the MGM, and it's for uh, the royal family. So there's an example where we're going we're gonna to use our name. We're, gonna man we're not franchising it because we're going to run those properties. Uh, so we're going to have a management contract and run it, but it's in a capital light zero way. In China, um, I did a deal with uh, the central government 11 years ago. Um, if you guys know history, because you weren't or thinking about this at the time, but when President Nixon went over and hung out with Mao, uh, Nixon stayed at the Dayutai State Guest House. Um, that's where all the heads of state all around the world, when they visit uh, Beijing, that's where they, they are put up. That's my partner. So I have a, a joint venture with Dayutai, and I'm building hotels throughout China. I have one in Chengdu, one in, in Hainan Island, uh, one opening on Bellagio is open in Shanghai in two months. Um, Beijing, um, Tianjin, Nanjing, uh, Shenzhen. Um, we got a lot of jins. We got a lot of uh, uh, Hangzhou. We just opened one in Hangzhou uh, last year. So we'll have about 20 hotels in China, but it, we're not putting money in where the developer. And why would I do that? because I think it's important for MGM to develop strong relationships with China. Um, and uh, that helps me expand my brand in markets where gambling will not be allowed. And uh, it's a good customer acquisition tool, therefore. And I think it helps me in Macau as well. So yes, the answer is yes. Yes, please. Uh, you said uh, your commitment to diversity is one of the core values at your firm. I'm just curious. Uh, with Trump presidency, uh, how do you think MGM will be affected, or perhaps uh, how would uh, international tourism in Las Vegas be affected? So I've been very vocal on this topic. Um, tourism is America's number one service export, number one. You know, having um, people come to the United States as tourists, come here to work, is, is economically very important to this country. Um, and I oppose any form of discrimination against allowing people to come here. Um, I know that from my own facts that international tourists, they stay longer and they spend more money. And they're more adventurous. And so they help small businesses more. The American tourists to Las Vegas are lazy. They just stay at my properties. That's fine. But the international tourists stay at my properties, but they also go to the Grand Canyon and the Hoover Dam and the Bryce and the Zion and Red Rock. And they, you work with small businesses for tours to do all that. International tourism is very, very important, which is why I was very active um, during the prior administration when um, Brand USA was passed. We passed the Travel Promotion Act to actually encourage people to come to the United States. What a concept. And uh, I do believe that you can have very strong borders and strong immigration and also a homeland security uh, policies by still being a fair-minded and a welcoming uh, country. And so um, it's the jury's out, I would say. Um, I'm on the business roundtable, uh, which is a bunch of CEOs that gather in, in DC. We talk about this a lot. And uh, you know, in the election, I supported the other candidate. Um, and um, I supported the other candidate because of what I believe in, in terms of immigration and trade and diversity. Um, and I didn't like what the candidate on the other side was saying. Um, but the candidate's now my president. And uh, so I support my president as I support the United States. But it doesn't mean I have to like everything. And it doesn't mean I'm going to change the way I believe. And I'm working very hard to make sure that the voice of my industry, 
of an industry of 17 uh, million strong, an industry that is a minority majority industry, um, an industry that in many cases people come to me, it's their first jobs ever in, uh, in the United States. And we literally have become the pathway to the middle class for tens of thousands of people of my 78,000 employees. Those are the things I cared about before the election. I still care about them exactly the same way today. Uh, yes? So Las Vegas is gaining an NFL team and yeah. NHL team. And yes. If you could talk a bit about the process of working with those organizations and also the opportunities that that presents for MGM. So I, I built uh, T-Mobile. That's a partnership with Phil Anschutz, AEG. So we own half of it, AEG owns half of it, and MGM runs T-Mobile. It was designed to be pro-ready for hockey and, wait for it, basketball. And uh, we've already been host of the Pac-12 basketball tournament and other basketball tournaments. And uh, as you say, we're having our first ever professional team. Uh, the Golden Knights start playing uh, this year. Um, I already know who their goalie is going to be, by the way, but I can't tell you. Um, and uh, that's going to drive a lot of business to town because if you're a Flyers fan, uh, you're going to want to see the Flyers play in Las Vegas, and I'm more than happy to put you up in a room there. Um, I bet I get an NBA team within four years. Um, and uh, that actually um, is going to be very also incrementally helpful to my town. Um, the Raiders are going to move. Uh, I was helpful in that process. Um, not because I was a Raiders fan. Um, I grew up in Connecticut, but because I'm a sports fan. And uh, I know that driving uh, more visits to Las Vegas will be a good thing. And oh, by the way, the stadium is going to be built right next to Mandalay Bay, which we happen to own. Um, so I think that as Las Vegas finds incremental reasons for people to come, whether it's sporting event, I'm sure we'll get a lot of college bowl games because we'll have that stadium. I bet we get an MLS team, um, which you know can play in that stadium. Um, the university will be able to use that stadium. It's just going to help the town, and it'll help drive tourism. And at the end of the day, um, that is what drives the state. 45% of the state's budget is in my industry, 45% of the entire state budget. So uh, our goal is to drive tourism, driving economic activity, which drives uh, prosperity, and I think that those teams will help. Um, whoever, uh, ladies first. Oh, and then, then. This is fun. You having fun? I'm having fun. Hi. Um, so you are the chairman of three companies. Um, just wondering, uh, where do you spend most of your time? Is in terms of certain business areas or geography or uh, issues they're trying to tackle? Thanks. So. Uh, I'm the chairman and CEO of MGM Resorts. I spend most of my time as the CEO of MGM Resorts. MGM Growth Properties has its own CEO and CFO. Um, former bankers. Guys were at UBS and Morgan Stanley and, and Greenhill. And MGM China has its own CEO and its own CFO. So I spend most of my time on MGM Resorts business and working with my fellow CEOs on the other two enterprises. Um, but they are very much linked, as you can imagine, because um, we look at projects together, MGM Resorts and MGM China, we look at projects together. Um, MGM Resorts and MGM Growth Properties looks at, look at projects together. But the majority of my time is spent at MGM Resorts because uh, the majority of the employees uh, that I am um, responsible for, those 78,000 employees, those are MGM Resorts employees. And uh, that's where I spend my time. So I spend my time on a plane um, and in Las Vegas. I'm probably going several years back with this one. Uh, but when you try to create half a billion, billion dollar in savings, a lot of them come from people. Yep. As a leader, how do you think objectively about, about these decisions? That was the old way. The question is, when you th think about savings, you think about people. So the old way of cutting costs in a labor-intensive business was just reduce people. Um, that's, by the way, the Wall Street way, too. Um, but uh, that's not what we did. So 
we have kept our, actually since 2007, um, on a same store basis, our FTEs, our full-time equivalents, have actually gone up. Um, and we've, we hire a lot on top of that, right? We just opened, you know, National Harbor, that's 4,000 new people, 3,000 new people next year in Massachusetts. So the, the key is creating efficiencies um, without negatively impacting employees. And then how do you do that? You uh, schedule more efficiently. So we have found um, with real-time scheduling, we can tailor people's work days um, more to the volumes of our business and actually more to their families. So we have more, far more flexible now as an employer than working Monday through Thursday, um, you know, nine, nine hours a day. It's, it's highly specialized. Um, so that's one way. The second way uh, is to ensure um, that you are creating uh, a pay scale with benefits that's superior to your competitors. Um, and that we've done because uh, that improves retention. Um, the third is finding ways to make the employee feel better engaged. So for example, I serve 42,000 meals a day to my employees in cafeterias. And I can assure you the food that I serve them is better than what you get here. Uh, we spend a lot of time on it. We source locally, organically. Um, we work on nutrition. Um, and our empo my employees know that I'm thinking about that for them. Um, and in fact, not only in their work environment, but we create those recipes and menus they take at home. Um, and so they can, you know, provide that at home. In healthcare, um, most we're the only employer that does this. Um, most employers, you have union employees that are on their own their own benefit plan, right? Then you have non-union employees. The non-union employees, which are half of my employees, I'm self-insured for. And the industry typically just goes with an HMO or a PPO. Um, not me. Now, we have those options, but I created something called a direct care plan. And I went to my employees and said, well, you can, you can be on this plan or this plan or we're going to create this new plan. What does this mean? We went out and scoured uh, the markets and we found 30 private practice groups, primary care physicians, and that signed up. Um, and we said to these doctors, um, we're going to give you three to 400 lives a year, maybe more. Um, we're going to pay you more than, than you're getting paid today. Um, but we're going to be in your office once a week. Uh, we're going to audit you. We're going to check uh, times, how long it takes someone to get an appointment. We're going to check your scripting. We're going to check uh, your, uh, your, your screening. Um, and uh, we're going to kick you out you know, if you're underperforming relative to the rest of the private practice groups. Um, and they said, the good doctor said, I'm all in. Um, we went to the employees and said, you can be in that PPO or an HMO, or you can join this plan. And here's the deal. It'll cost you less, and you're going to get a doctor. And the doctor's going to speak your language, and the doctor's going to be near where you live, and you're going to get an appointment within 24 hours. And uh, you know what? This is what you have to do, though. You have to get an annual physical, an annual dental exam, and you have to be compliant with your medicines. And if you're not, we're going to kick you out you know, to put some responsibility where it belongs as well on the employee uh, itself. So we're the only ones that do this. So you ask a question about employees. It's not, it's not you know, how many you have. It's how engaged they are and how you think about how to make their life better, whether it is um, scheduling a work for a, a single parent to take care of their kids or what you're doing on health care, or on nutrition, or on wellness in general, uh, access to uh, you know, health clubs, bringing in employee networking groups, of which we have 20, by the way, um, so that people can feel like they're part of a, 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 an ecosystem of like-minded or, or people they want to talk to. Um, and if you do that, you'll find you can save an awful lot of money in other areas. Um, without touching um, your employee workforce. And in fact, if you do it correctly, 
you can drive revenue, which in turn requires you to hire more people. We're the largest convention company in Las Vegas. So the fact that Las Vegas is doing so well benefits us more than any other company. We hire more banquet servers, more security officers, more food and beverage uh, personnel, uh, more EDS, uh, more engineers. Um, and so it's a, it's a balance of being smart, um, but being um, empathetic and being in the relationship to the employee that I think is the differentiator of the company and why I can show to my board that my retention rates are twice as good as my competitors. Uh, my absenteeism rates are half my competitors. Um, my average employee, um, in terms of their scores, because we ask them to rate us, are 30 to 40 percent better than my competitors. And um, when people come to our properties, um, their scores, because we ask our guests, um, are higher than they've ever been before. And I'll leave you with that thought, this thought, which is that, you know, I, I, in my company, you know, we're not, we're not curing cancer. Um, I wish we were, um, but we're not. We have to be honest with ourselves of what we do. We create environments for people to be with their friends, their family, to do business, and they're going to come and if they have a good time, that's great. If they don't have a good time, they're not going to tell me, right? They're going to tell all their friends, though. They're going to go home to Philly or go, go someplace and say the bad time. So I'm in a fragile business. I have to earn my right to this customer relationship every single day. And the way you do that is to create these experiences. And the way you do that is to have the best, uh, best motivated, uh, happiest employees because that's the – that the personal connection that makes all the difference. Okay. How'd I do, Matt? Is that right? Is that right? Okay. So obviously, thank you so much for all being here. And, and I think on behalf of everyone in the audience, on behalf of Wharton, and on behalf of the Leadership Lecture Committee, Thank you so much for, for t making the trip to be here and obviously for sharing such incredible insights. Uh, we'd like to give you this gift on behalf of everyone in the room and everyone at Wharton as a, as a small gesture of thank you. Heavy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining. Can I open it?